could you please discuss the background for this study? Uh, sure. So this study really came out of interest um, during kind of the opioid epidemic that we've been seeing across the United States over the past few years. It's now been well documented. Um, so Dr. Watts had this really interesting question of, can we highlight a way that um, our opioid practices have sort of changed over the last few years? And particularly, um, we're in New York, in the state of New York, any prescriber um, who is authorized to prescribe any form of narcotics was required to take a state mandated um, course on opioid prescriptions. So whether it was a um, attending, a resident, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner, we we're all required to take this training. Um, and using that as sort of a natural intervention, um, Dr. Watts had sort of posed this question of, let's see if in our own department, um, if urologists had a change in prescription practices before taking the course compared to after the course and see if we see any differences um, at all. And that's really where um, the study was sort of born. I think just to follow up to what Dr. Devalor said that, um, you know, we were able to use that training course as a finite time point in history just because it was a requirement. So we knew that anyone with a DEA license for prescribing narcotics had done it in the state. Um, but we also just were aware of the, the palpable um, awareness of the opioid epidemic. And so this is not a, a causal paper in any way, shape, or form, but it was a time point that we could use as a reference and as an opportunity to just look at our own practice in an academic summer and see what the effects were. And uh, what were some of the notable findings and were any of them uh, a surprise to you and your co-authors? Yeah, I think, you know, the the amount of um, narcotic prescriptions that were going out were very surprising to all of us. I think we had just assumed that they'd be lower, particularly looking at the amount of prescriptions that were being done prior to the New York State epidemic. We have to remember that this was before 2017. This is right when the epidemic was kind of coming to light, you know, becoming more of a public health crisis. I um, mean, the awareness around it was really growing. And it was really interesting to see something as simple as an outpatient ambulatory surgery getting you know, so many narcotic prescriptions. Um, I think one of the things that I was personally really excited to see was that there was actually a decrease in um, the prescription practices after this mandated training was seen. And we saw it in a couple of ways um, that uh, was interesting to sort of quant you know, quantify. So we didn't actually see an overall decrease in the number of the of prescriptions being written. So, you know, if X amount of patients were getting a narcotic prescription before the training, still a similar amount of X, you know, amount of patients were getting it. However, the amount of actual, you know, tablets they were getting decreased significantly. So, you know, um, it went down um, quite a bit in terms of the amount that they were getting. So they were getting, you know, 15 tablets on average prior to the training. And after the training, they were getting actually about eight tablets on average. Um, which is a decrease in the amount of narcotics that they were getting. Um, additionally, we saw an interesting shift of patients who were going from getting these acetaminophen oxycodone prescriptions, um, with the brand name being Percocet. Um, that was, we actually saw that number of prescription uh, decrease after the training, um, which was wonderful, but it was actually associated with an increase um, uh, acetaminophen and codeine prescription or Tylenol number three. Um, and so when we saw that was something that I found was very surprising just because I, I, you think that maybe urologists may not view, you know, something like codeine as um, potent as a, of a narcotic like oxycodone. And on the DEA drug class, it is a class lower than oxycodone is. And so that sort of correlates. But that was something that I thought was just a very interesting finding. And, you know, beg to the question of what is our perception of these different tiers of, of uh, you know, narcotic levels. In your paper, you noted that there was a subgroup of patients undergoing stent placement uh, that saw a change in prescription practices. Uh, could you expand on that? Yeah, so when um, we looked further at the cohorts um, that we had subcategorized by procedure, and one of the, the cohorts we had looked at were any individuals who had a ureteroscopy that were undergoing a stent. Um, a stent. Um, and a stent is a small tube that you put in the ureter um, 
to allow you know the ureter to heal after a kidney stone surgery and to just drain. Um, and oftentimes these stents can cause a lot of discomfort for patients and it can be a urologist woe on how to manage stent discomfort. And typically, you know, we saw that those people were getting a lot of narcotics. Um, what we found was that after the training, those patients who were getting stents um, actually had a decrease in narcotic prescriptions. So this is including, you know, oxycodone, codeine prescriptions, everything had decreased. But what we saw was a concomitant increase in non-narcotic prescriptions. So whether it was Flomax um, or Tamsulosin, um, uh, oxybutynin, some uh, NSAIDs were much more commonly prescribed. So suddenly we saw, you know, this correlation with, um, with urologists trying to utilize non-narcotic medications much more aggressively in an effort, you know, what we presume, you know, to decrease narcotic prescription. Uh, do you think there would be any value to a urology department specific opioid awareness course? Yeah, so, you know, there have been some um, papers looking at, you know, specifically risks associated with urology surgeries, procedures um, that have opioid prescriptions in the perioperative setting and risk for opioid addiction. And so uh, two uh, papers that came out in the last year and a half found that younger patients, males, uh, and those who were prescribed a higher number of uh, narcotic tablets in their actual prescription were more likely to develop uh, opioid addiction. And these are for very, very routine uh, sort of frequent surgeries or even outpatient procedures that we do. You wouldn't even think of this being a, a thing. Uh, and so we actually, uh, as one of the follow-up uh, initiatives for this in, in our department this summer, um, we launched a summer sort of QI project where um, I had an undergraduate research fellow who looked at our prescription practices for all of our surgeries, not just the ambulatory endoscopic surgeries, um, for the last 15 months. So we wanted to see across pediatric urology, adult urology, inpatient surgery, outpatient surgery, everything we've been doing. What have we, what's our, our prescription uh, uh, practices? Uh, and we presented it to our entire faculty, as well as the residents and our advanced practice providers uh, this month, actually earlier this month, to show here's what we are doing, and here is how the different cases sort of compare to each other as far as average number of tablets in morphine milligram equivalents, which is a standardized unit for narcotics to compare one drug to another. Um, and from that, uh, we are uh, actually generating a protocol uh, for how many uh, actual tablets per drug type uh, we are recommending per surgery uh, and implementing that. So there have, to, sort of getting back to your initial question, there, there is data that say that just talking about opioid addiction increases prescribers' awareness and improves their uh, likely or increases their likelihood to um, lower their prescription practices. So my follow-up look at what we're going to do now is to see if even just having that sort of presentation and showing what we're doing uh, has an impact on what, what everyone in the department is doing. Beyond you know, what you were describing earlier, do you and your group plan to do any more research on this topic? And if so, what would the focus be? Yeah, there's so they, they there's sort of different subsets of this right now. So there is a standard pathway now for our uh, robotic prostatectomies for prostate cancer and our robotic partial nephrectomies for renal cell cancer. So it's an actual scripted protocol for how many tablets and alternatives to opioid narcotics um, prescriptions patients should get both in the hospital as well as when they go home. And so the goal now is. Uh, to mirror a protocol similar to some of the work, say, that's been done at University of Michigan in the Department of Surgery, um, to, to develop a protocol to say, you know, if you get, a, for example, one of these cases we looked at, cystoscopy, ureteroscopy, and a stent, you can only prescribe between zero and X number of tablets uh, of an opioid. Here are alternatives to consider. And if you're going above this, there has to be a really valid reason why. Uh, and, and to look over the next few months after we launch this to see how, how provider practices may change. Because 
the reality is that yes, we have got we got better during that time period that we looked at. Uh, you know, we prescribed fewer tablets and less potent uh, opioid tablets, but we're still prescribing too many. Um, a lot of people would say really after most of these cases, patients shouldn't be getting any uh, narcotics. And I think that's really where we should be going. Um, so that's the goal over the next few months and to look at that. What would you say uh, the take home message is for the practicing urologists? I think that the take home message is kind of simple in the sense of uh, you hear it in the news. I mean, you can't, you can't be a, a practicing provider now and not be aware of problems with opioids and narcotics. Um, there's so many regulations even just to be able to prescribe them. Uh, but I think that the take home message for this is that uh, what we do is not without risk and pain is real, um, but we can create problems in trying to uh, address pain if, if we don't approach it in a systematic way. Uh, and that even in the most mundane or simple of cases that we do, we do put patients at a potential risk, even unintentionally of developing uh, opioid addiction. Uh, and so um, it's important to be aware of what you as a provider are prescribing, or if you work in an academic center, what the person writing prescriptions for you is prescribing. You may not be aware of what that disconnect is, uh, and to, to be as, uh, as restrictive as possible, but be, make sure that you're still addressing patients' uh, pain appropriately. I think Dr. Watts, that's a great point, um, you know, just making urologists be aware that we're over-prescribing. And I think the other thing that was so interesting to me is you know, when you look at this, no urologist, no physician, I think anyone on the course of, you know, that's employed anywhere gets excited about taking a mandated course, right? That's about the dullest thing that anyone can be excited to do, even if it is a very interesting topic such as this one. Um, and I think this, the, you know, the findings that we saw that this association, um, you know, or this correlation that we were able to sort of demonstrate that something as, again, mundane as an online state mandated opioid course was able to provide some sort of a change, you know, um, for prescription practices is pretty, is pretty interesting. Um, and so theoretically, if you could actually make that even a little bit more engaging, right? So whether you present it at Grand Rounds, like, you know, we did at, at Montefiore or whether you have this more engaged way of having a protocol that all the department urologists adhere to, suddenly you can really bring about really great change in a really simple fashion. And that's what I thought was a really exciting sort of finding of this study, that it doesn't take a lot, it takes a little to get some change, and a little bit more effort can get a lot of change. And that was, that was pretty exciting, I thought. The only other thing I would just sort of follow up to say is so the uh, American Neurologic Association had, is putting out a, a white paper on uh, sort of opioid and pain control um, uh, practices. So it's, um, uh, it's something I've, I've reviewed as uh, part of a uh, member of the Quality Improvement Patient Safety Committee. Um, so it, should, it will be coming out. So there will be some uh, not formal guidelines, but at least best practice statement recommendations coming from the American Neurologic Association that I think are very timely. Um, and I, I think that in general, um, we as surgeons and in, in any really surgical field, people just have to keep, keep it in the forefront of their mind and talk about it, uh, be aware of it. And just because you know, this was big news several years ago doesn't mean that it's gone away and the problem hasn't gone away. Uh, and so, um, you know, talking about it, being aware is, is uh, still really important. Is there anything else that you uh, think our audience should know about uh, your research and the, the, the findings? Um, I think, you know, it's always exciting. I think, you know, over the last, you know, five years, there's been a lot of literature across all of medicine, um, particularly, you know, surgery, you know, general surgery, urology, that you, we do actually need a lower amount of narcotics than have been traditionally prescribed, um, which is, it's been great. That's been demonstrated over and over again. I think our study sort of looked at okay, is there an intervention where we can try to modify, you know, these behaviors? 
And so I think now it's been shown and the next sort of few years really needs to be dedicated to really um, making these practices normal, making them a mainstay and making that implementation not just happen at like the academic centers, but really disseminate throughout all of, all of the practices, throughout all of the communities um, to really start to battle um, this opioid risk that we see. Yeah, and I, I also think I, I would never underestimate or undervalue the uh, the importance of preoperative counseling of patients. So, you know, a lot of what we do is about setting your patient's expectations. So, you know, we found definitely that putting a stent in patients was significantly associated with receipt of a opioid narcotic. And the reason for that is that stents are uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that patients need an opioid to manage that. So, you know, a lot of this is taking the extra couple minutes or someone you work with, you know, advising the patient beforehand, reminding them the day of surgery, if you're putting a stent in or you're doing whatever surgery you're gonna do, there will be some discomfort after. We're gonna give you some, some medications to help with that. It may not be perfect, but it's temporary. It's gonna be better and we'll get it out of you as soon as we can. It's, um, patients will understand that more as opposed to if they have this unexpected symptoms after. Um, that's, a, that's really a, our responsibility as surgeons. Again, just remind them that you know, if they are getting narcotics or if, they, you know, if they're not getting narcotics, you say, this is why you're not getting it. The addiction potential is very high. And you know, I always tell someone who's like 25 or 30 that I'm talking to, I say, you actually are at a very high risk of getting it. Um, and saying that in itself just sort of re reiterates that, um, again, a point that Dr. Watts made earlier, but I think one that's really important in the pre-op um, pre counseling stage.